Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Derek Young, here for some K-State headlines for the week. This is going to become a reoccurring thing where each week we'll bring you uh, three, five, whatever number of the biggest headlines and most notable things going on with K-State during the week. And this week, I mean, there, there really is a mix of notable things, but we talked about it last night. I, so much of what has gone on this week, it feels like it's been covered because it's so fascinating and people have been intrigued by it, by, hey, what's going on with this guy? What's going on in camp? And uh, then some other things that have been a little off the radar as well, and some of it involves recruiting or uh, past recruits or whatever else it may be. But before we dive into all of that, a reminder that if you want to join the Wildcats in Ireland as they kick off the 2025 football season against Iowa State in the Aer Lingus College Football Classic, you can purchase game tickets now through a travel or hospitality package. All-inclusive travel packages include premium game tickets, luxury hotel accommodations, an exclusive K-State welcome experience, and more. Game day hospitality packages include premium in-state hospitality, in-stadium hospitality with food and drinks and premium game tickets. Don't miss out on the trip of a lifetime. Book your package now at cats2ireland.com. That's cats, the number two, ireland.com. So a good way to uh, remind everybody to get hooked up there and uh, get everything you need through cats to Ireland uh, to make sure that you're watching K-State and Iowa State. I'm sure there are a lot of people that, they don't miss many Farmageddons, whether it's in Manhattan or Ames. And so you definitely don't want to miss it if it's going to be in Dublin like 2025. I, I'm still um, very shocked that, that's, that this is happening, right? Yeah. It, it's, it doesn't seem like a very Iowa State thing to do. It doesn't seem like a very Kansas State thing to do. They're going to do it together. It's also going to be strange just playing a big, big 12 game. <laughs> right yeah. out of the gate like that i think that might be the biggest shock to the system <laughs> and it being in first you get to play in week zero second you get to play in ireland third it's a big 12 game yeah and so it's not just hey we're playing in week zero in ireland it's a very consequential game i thought you were trying to say that uh k-state and iowa state people didn't come across as world travelers yeah which... well i would um actually you know maybe maybe someone could say that but i wasn't necessarily saying that i was saying it's definitely not something i've seen the kansas state administration necessarily open to um yeah but when yeah when it's a little bit of a money grab i guess that's a good carrot well uh this k-state fan has not ever been a world traveler uh so that's that's that stands true for me. All right, let's dive into some of these headlines, talk a little bit about some of the more notable things going on around K-State this week. And we'll start with, I was debating on where we should go first with this, but I think that it is the most notable thing. We have not talked about it yet okay. here, uh, but we got to start with, he's no longer our quarterback, K-Staters, but he is still Derek Young's quarterback. Oh, uh, gosh. Will Howard with his quotes about he doesn't have to be a hero at Ohio State. And before we break this down, I'll just play Will Howard talking about not having to be a hero anymore. Um, that's a good question. Everything is everything's heightened here. You know, I think, you know, the, the you know, you, you feel you feel the eyes a little bit and you feel um, I think I think the you know the the one thing I would say is that I don't feel like I have to be a hero here, and I feel like I have the guys around me to where I just need to facilitate and just get them the ball and make good decisions. And at the end of the day, I don't have to go out there and do anything super superhuman. You know, I just have to be myself and and trust the guys around me. And all right, so uh, he then goes on to talk about how. Uh, how much of a blessing it's been that camp has been tough because Ohio State has a very, very good defense uh, and that that audio and video from WBNS-TV. Uh, look, this was one of those that when you first see the quotes and everything that comes with it, you go, hmm, that doesn't sound great. And that comes off as being disrespectful uh, to K-State and what he had at K-State. And But then you can kind of start to think about it like there are elements of what he said that are true it's without a doubt easier to play quarterback at Ohio state because you do, you do have more weapons in terms of what's going to be there. Ohio state 
the last however many years has had a, a first round draft pick wide receiver. They're on their way to doing that again. They have two phenomenal running backs. Like they are very loaded for Will Howard, in addition to having that that tough defense that's going to make it easier on an offense as well. But it does feel like there would have been a way to convey that message without throwing some shots, it would seem, at your old school, even if that's not how it was meant to be. Because there's a chance, you know, it's a tough question to answer without coming across as disrespectful because we can all be honest. There are clear differences between playing football at Ohio State and K-State. At Ohio State, the expectation is to win a national championship every year. In most years, you have a team you know, maybe not the last three years of Ryan Day coaching, but most years you have a team capable of doing that. And the talent there would dictate that. They are going to get higher ranked guys in recruiting, which we know matters overall. There are, are a lot of things where you can say this or that, but the thing that sticks out to me here is nobody ever asked Will Howard to be a hero at K-State, especially the last two seasons where we've talked about it numerous times, but you can compare what's gone on talent-wise at K-State in the last two seasons to two other pockets of short time in K-State history. And that would be the late 90s and the very early 2000s in terms of success on the field and then pro talent that has been sent to the NFL. And when you say that you didn't have to be a hero, nobody was asking you to be a hero at K-State when you had Deuce Vaughn and Ben Sennett and Cooper Beebe and as you, you know, it was pointed out, KT Leviston also in the NFL and other offensive linemen. You had defensive guys like Felix Anyadike Uzama, Julius Brents, Josh Hayes. All of these guys and more have put themselves in a position. And while, yes, it's easier to play quarterback at Ohio State, nobody needed Hero Ball Howard last year. And nobody was asking for that. So, that's where it comes across as a little bit of a disconnect and maybe still some sour grapes about how things went down over the last year. And really for the totality of Will Howard's career, which has been a narrative for a long time. Like he got jostled around. It was a weird thing for him. Some of it his own doing, some of it just tough luck. Uh, but it, it didn't come across as great. Yeah. Well, first off, you said the last three teams, maybe not uh, for Ohio state and, national championship i will say in 22 if they make a field yeah, goal they, they actually true. beat george they beat georgia and that was the semifinal. yeah so, and they probably beat tcu too so <laughs> so they, they were a field goal away in 22 so i'll give them that one uh and probably this one because it will be one of the more talented teams we've probably ever seen in college football at least on paper which establishes the point that will howard was trying to make i believe uh, the point he was trying to make is inaccurate, right? At Ohio State, the weapons are such that he can be facilitator um, more than anything. The problem, and, and I guess I'm really going to repeat probably 99% of what you just elaborated on, is that where he struggled at Kansas State, and not necessarily in 2022 because he got hot and took him to the Big 12 title and won. Uh, and that was kind of a thing of Will Howard's career and tenure in Manhattan is that he's a quarterback that runs hot and cold when he is on, he can be a special quarterback when he is not, uh, it can get a little bit ugly. It can get a little bit sideways. We saw that at Oklahoma state. We saw that for a good chunk of the Texas game. Uh, the, those are definitely two games he went back and even some of the wins probably wasn't his best, um, uh, if KU catches a pick six, they beat them last year. Let, let's be honest with that. And where Will Howard ran into problems, and this statement that he kind of rattled off this week kind of shows you why things happened the way that he did, is things got sideways and things didn't go well because Will Howard tried to be a hero when he didn't have to. Like, I remember – a lot of last year with the coaches would say, and even what I would say, either on Tuesdays or immediately after the game is you got to take the simple play that's in front of you and not try to do something too much. Right. Like they, they, that's what they said. Like, don't be worried. Don't 
don't not want to go take that simple play. And sometimes he didn't make that. So I look, I, I understand the point he was trying to make. It's an accurate one, but he didn't have to do it at, at, at the expense of his teammates in the past. And it kind of shows you why he did run into the trouble sometimes that he did, because apparently he believed he had to be the hero when he didn't have to. And yes, Ohio state is more talented, but Kansas state's offensive line last year, you can make an argument might be better than Ohio State's offensive line this year. Uh, Kansas State still had a really good running back, Deuce Vaughn, uh, that went to the NFL, and then they had a really good one in DJ Giddens that ran for over a thousand yards. They had a pretty good tight end that got drafted in the second round. They had a pretty, they had two offensive linemen that got drafted. Uh, the, they weren't empty when it comes to talent either. Yeah, I just uh, there like it's a tough message to convey because if you. If you state the obvious like you have to in that question, like we know that Ohio State is is better than K State, like we, we know this, uh, and but you you know the bringing in having to be superhuman and and the word hero like all of this like that's just it, it's not accurate to what had to happen. Like in the last couple of seasons, we have seen heroic performances at quarterback for K State. I just it thought was, of something by the way. It was Adrian Martinez and Norman and Avery Johnson and Lubbock. Like those are games where they needed somebody to step up and carry them to a win and those two guys did it in those settings. The other games, I mean, this is this is where like I was, you know, arguing with with big brand Alec Bussey who who I once worked with and still talked to quite a bit. And he just I mean, if if you're one of the big brands in college football, he's going to defend the life out of you and and trash on the little guys. And so we're talking about this, and he's While like, "Yeah, but, the little guy." <laughs> yeah, he's like, "But like, look at all this other stuff that like went on." And I'm, I'm, he brings up some of the other games. And I'm like, like think of that Oklahoma State game where K State just trounced. He, he but, but that's what I was going to do. Actually, I was going to take back the last two Oklahoma State games. Is like when Will Howard's best performance is when they beat Oklahoma State two years ago, 48 to zero. That was a superhuman performance, but he's again, he didn't even have to be a superhuman because Oklahoma State didn't score, right? But yeah, but last year, like, he didn't have to be a superhuman. He just didn't have, if he doesn't throw four interceptions, they yeah. win. That's, yeah, I, it's not to not have, if he doesn't throw four interceptions, they win. That's not having to be superhuman. That's not, that's just not being a mistake for a mistake quarterback. Yeah. And I think that's probably where the misconception is for for will because i mean there are there are numerous times throughout his career mainly the first two years and a couple of times last year where he made a bevy of mistakes and it led to close game losses for k-state like i mean that the the 2020 season was the prime example of that where you're just like how how is this happening and then a little bit last year and, and everything else with his career but i was even going to say like you think about the plays that were made during the 2022 season when he took over at quarterback like he had serious help to make those plays by some of those guys where I mean the catch by RJ Garcia like it was a heck of a throw by Will Howard but also like RJ went up and, and got the ball or the, even that Oklahoma State game like that's Cade Warner making a heck of a catch to start it on fourth down I, and I Deuce Vaughn making a diving catch in the end zone like not many like you had to get help from others in those situations whereas we saw in what I would deem the two heroic performances of the last two years at quarterback for K-State, Avery Johnson and Adrian Martinez, they got help from other guys on their team, no doubt. Like the K-State defense was great in Lubbock. Deuce Vaughn and Ben Sennett had good games in Norman. But those two guys specifically made plays on their own when they needed to, numerous times. I've covered every Kansas State football game since – September of 2017, and the best quarterback game was Adrian Martinez and Norman. Yeah, yeah, and, and look, it, and the coaches thought that Adrian should still be the quarterback when he came back the first time, even after Will <laughs> played really well against TCU. If he doesn't get hurt in that game, I think K-State wins in Fort Worth, and they dominate Oklahoma State, but they still went in the next week, and they thought, okay, Adrian Martinez is our best bet against Texas, and they lost to Texas, and they still said, He's our best guy when they went down to Waco and played Baylor before he got hurt again and and wiped away the rest of his college career, essentially. So it, this is not to bash Will Howard. Will Howard did a lot of good things for K-State. He was a great representative of K-State. But this is another one of those things that, like, you know, if, if, if you're Will Howard and you wonder, man, why are K-State fans still on my back? 
comments like this are going to go there because people are territorial about this stuff. K-State is an important place to them. K-State fans have emotional ties to Deuce Vaughn and Ben Sennett and Cooper Beebe and all of these guys that played a big part over the last two years of K-State football. So when people feel like they are getting slighted, they're going to have negative emotional reactions. Like, I I am very much on record as being very soured and anti-Bruce Weber still because when I was sitting in a hotel room watching his final Zoom press conference the day he got fired as the K-State basketball coach, it really, really bothered me how he decided to trash my alma mater, a place that's really important to me, my family, and everything else, by essentially saying, well, you know, they didn't help me here. He made excuses for all this stuff. He said that they're the worst fans on social media, which is hilarious for a coach that came to K-State in 2012 to be discussing social media like it was a blown-up thing when he was in Champaign. Like, that's that sat poorly with me. And I, I have still strong feelings against Bruce Weber because of that, even despite feeling like I was on a path to forgive the forgiveness there, even though he trashed my school's basketball program the last three years of his career. Will Howard is going to have to understand that he's going to have to package these words a little bit differently and at least find a little bit more respect for his time at K-State moving forward because he never had to be the hero at K-State. There were heroic performances by him in, sh in short spurts. He made big-time plays. He was integral to them winning a Big 12 championship. That cannot, be, that cannot be told in any other way. That is factual. But nobody ever asked him to be a hero, especially last year, the way you lay it out, where they win in Stillwater if he doesn't throw three picks. You know, the, the game the game at Texas, like we saw, they got off to a slow start. The whole offense did. He played really well in the second half. Like, he was a key part in them getting back and forcing that game to overtime. He He's not the reason they lost the game to Iowa State last year. Like, he played well for the most part last year. But the Missouri and Oklahoma State games, when the, those games were there for the taking, road games against really good teams, you didn't have to do anything superhuman in those games to win, and he just didn't even meet the normal expectations. So it, it's it's a tough conversation to have. There's a lot of ways that people can go too far one way or the other, but certainly one that was probably the most notable K-State thing happening this week. His point wasn't totally incorrect. He used inappropriate – things to kind of get it across even non-factual because as you said yes it's easier to be a facilitator at Ohio State given the weapons at your disposal but you didn't have to be a hero to win last year now maybe you felt like you had to be the hero against Iowa State because your defense couldn't stop anyone and that's it, fair but you it wasn't because of your offensive weapons because you were scoring and you weren't doing anything superhuman to score um and against Texas, you had a really good second half, and maybe you felt like you had to be superhuman on the last play because Colin Kahn kind of left you out the drive with that play call when Texas defense coordinator won that battle. Mm -hmm. But you didn't play well in the first half. Uh, you didn't have to be superhuman to win Oklahoma State. You just didn't have to turn the ball over all, all over the place. Um, you attempting to be superhuman got you into trouble sometimes. Um, like I mentioned, you didn't play well at Texas Tech, and you got pulled. You didn't play. You didn't play well at Kansas, but you figured it out at the end somehow. So, yeah, his point made sense, but he didn't have to be a hero. Yeah, no, and that's uh, that's that's where the conversation can lie. All right, moving on, let's focus a little bit more on active Kansas State players because we got a lot of different news and notes throughout the week on things going on in fall camp, and maybe the most notable was how much praise Keegan Johnson was getting and not only from coaches, but also his teammates. And I would also say the amount of people that either commented on the, the YouTube video of his press conference or in a, a thread like Keegan looks bigger. He, he looks that all seems like very good news. And probably out of anything that's going on with current players on the team, the most significant development because K-State. Look, Will Howard, the one area he is right, he did not have a great wide receiver core last year. They they left some things to be desired. Yep. And because Keegan and Johnson played was, a part of that. Yeah. That I mean Will Howard can probably his biggest complaint is what happened to the 23 wide wide receiver room, right? Uh Jace Brown didn't come on until late. So who were the starters? You had Phillip Brooks, who just had a 
you know, a, a typical Philip Brooks season. Keegan Johnson, that didn't go too well. Jaden Jackson, great start, then faded. Like, he, he was not blessed with a great wide receiving core in 23. Um, I'm, I think he's selling his 22 receivers a little short uh, in general. Um, but I, I had the, the same reaction. The Keegan Johnson stuff I thought was pretty major this weekend, and you got huge praise about on for him from his coaches and teammates. But just like you kind of alluded to, like the biggest takeaway for me was just how he presented himself in that press conference. He had total command and confidence of what he was saying and was being transparent and accountable for last year at the same time when that didn't necessarily have to happen. Like that was in the rear view mirror. And it was just a very, it just felt like a very cerebral adult conversation, which he had total command of. And then he just looked physically the part so much more than at any time last year. So a lot of good things said about King and Johnson, but what has me more confident about what he is going to do this year is just how he looked and how he spoke during his press conference. Which I, I will say is a, a pretty impressive thing for a guy that has gone through some of the, the downturns and negatives that he has experienced. Like, Last year was not a, a good year for him, even though, you know, you think, hey, going fresh start, new place. Like, it took him a long time to get things going. He dealt with more injuries, all this other stuff. And I would say, like, we did start to see towards the, the back half of the year, he had some good moments against Texas. He he was good in the game against KU. He was good in the bowl game. Like, but this is a guy that in his time at Iowa and then his first year at K-State, there's been a lot of negativity that could be directed towards him. So for him to pull himself out of it, and kind of you know take accountability and and have this fresh mindset. It's a positive thing going forward. So I everything that involved Keegan Johnson this past week was a true positive for K State moving forward. Yeah, and everything that's kind of kind of going on with him, it's easy to go a similar route to kind of the other stuff we've said and maybe feel sorry for himself. He just never has done that. Yeah. So it, I, I would say very similar to how like Adrian Martinez handle things once he got to K-State. Like, if there was one guy that could have been so broken down by the way that he got treated, uh, it could have been Adrian Martinez. And and even after that Tulane game, like, he could have been like that. But uh, the, the, the switch flipped for Adrian, and he got it figured out, and it worked out well for him until he got hurt. Uh, and, and Keegan Johnson, you know, same type of boat here where uh, we'll see how it works out this coming year. Uh, one other very specific duo that got mentions this week were the corners talking about how they kept their speed up but they've also added weight and primarily Keenan Garber and Jacob Parrish were the notes here and really two impressive guys because Jacob Parrish is one that came in and basically had a play at a pretty young age and then Keenan Garber he's relatively young as a corner because he didn't make that switch until what like three weeks left in the regular season of the 2022 season, something like that. So those two guys got good notes this week, which is big for K-State because we know uh, you can never have enough good DBs in the Big 12. Yeah, Parrish had to play when he was really young. I didn't necessarily know everything that he was doing. He was really light, um, probably not strong enough. Keenan Garber had to play when you know he had only played corner for like a week and a half uh, and then had to kind of learn everything on the fly. And he was probably still a little light, um, but fast. So really the only thing either one of them had going for them while being thrown into the fire was, hey, you're fast and you can hang with all these. Now they kind of know what they're doing. Now they're stronger. Now they're heavier. And now they're even faster. So, yeah, if you didn't know any better, by the way, that everyone talked about them this week, and especially head coach Chris Kleiman, uh, these might be the two best players on the team. That's what your takeaway would be. Yeah. Uh, another group that we kind of got some clarity on this week was the offensive line. We went over that uh, earlier in the week after Connor Riley talked because Chris Kleiman, he made it a little bit more of a puzzle to piece together how the offensive line was working. And then Connor Riley was just like, here are the five guys. Here are two guys that are very close to being the five guys. And then we got work to do uh, beyond that. What What was your number one takeaway with how the offensive line appears to be shaping up right now? That it's for the most part what we anticipated. I think uh, Easton Kilty at left tackle, despite what Kleiman said, I was like, no, I'm pretty sure Easton Kilty is going to be the left tackle, and I doubt it's going to be 50 50. And Connor Riley kind of 
reaffirmed th- that notion, that stance. And and that's nothing against John Pastore. And I'm sure Chris Kleiman didn't want to slight John Pastore and wanted him to keep generating positive movement forward and upward trajectory. And I'm sure that that's part of it. Some of it, this is a psychological stuff, right? That they have to play, that they have to try to keep guys engaged. So I would say John Pastore is going to play a good chunk of football this year. Just I don't yeah. see him as a starter. And then Taylor Portia, I think, is going to get the, you know, this is going to sound like a slight. I don't mean it as that. It's going to get the benefit of the doubt and is going to probably be your day one starter at right guard. Uh, does he stick there? I think, and it's not because of himself, I think he is the the biggest challenge of holding on to his starting job just because of how good Andrew Line game can be. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to be fascinating how some of those other spots work out because they're when you say, hey, there are seven guys that are basically starter quality right now on this offensive line, that means nobody can get too comfortable. And there's, I mean, versatility was preached about the offensive line this week. We know that in the past, K-State has had v- very versatile offensive linemen. So anybody at any time could slide into one of the five spots on the line if somebody's not doing their job. So uh, the it sounds like things are going well there, which should be expected because I think any of us that have paid attention to K-State have shied away from the more national narrative that is, oh, K-State's losing all these guys in their offensive line. Well, yes, that is true. We know that they're replenishing it with guys that have been around a long time, have good experience, and come across as being very talented. So Con- Connor Riley's right. It's weird that you they basically lost four, what, three-year starters, maybe a four-year starter in there too, with KT Leviston, Cooper BB, Christian, du- Christian Duffy, and Hayden Gillum, and you're basically still have four returning starters somehow because Easton Kilty, FCS level, but a lot of starting college football experience. Hadley Panzer started all last year. Taylor Portier's played a lot of college football. Carver Willis basically started the last half of the season because he supplanted Christian Duffy. So they have the luxury of basically replacing four starters with four starters. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's good news there on the offensive line. All right, final thing to close things out here. This comes from the recruiting world, and if you want more on it, go to kstateonline.com because Drew posted an update with him this week, but that would be R.J. Collins, uh, the, the, D, the DB commit out of Kansas City, crazy fast, great track times. He got an offer from USC, and this is another one of those where we, we talk about it all the time, but – like just because K State offers a guy and you're like, oh, he's not rated yet or whatever else, like they know how to evaluate dudes. And this is one of the better examples of it because Lincoln Riley and the Trojans have come calling for some of that speed. Uh, so what do you make of RJ Collins getting the USC offer and and what that might mean moving forward for K State's recruitment of him? Yeah, a little bit of a validation of what Kansas State saw for first, uh though. I, I, I don't want to accidentally excuse Lincoln Riley for good defense. That's <laughs> he's not, not, not hasn't been that ever. Um, I guess you could say, uh, we'll see what happens in LA this year. Uh, probably worse now that they're in the big 10 and not going to have the physicality, but I, I'm not worried here. At least at this time, be, I, I could say I'm not worried, which is only a current, feeling and then i could be worried in a few months and people were like you were wrong no at the time i was right and things change uh usc's are you know a a a program with name recognition so if he ever gets his head turned anytime between now and signing day and decides he wants to visit los angeles it wouldn't be completely shocking right but at this time i just don't see that happening i you know, his par- both of his parents went to Kansas State, so I think that affinity and that connection and that strong tie might help the Wildcats get across the finish line. Yeah, no, good. it seems like good news there still. And uh, like you said, more validation than anything in this recruitment for R.J. Collins getting the USC offer. So uh, that will do it for us as we close out the first edition of the Weekly Headlines. We'll be back with it again next week and run it all throughout the season to keep you in the know with the Cats in uh, – this one ends up being 30 minutes or less. They may be a little bit shorter moving forward. But the, the Will Howard conversation dominated 
quite a bit of time. So that will do it for us. We are out of here. If you want more on the cats, go to on three, find K state online. You can also subscribe, comment, get in the conversation right here on the KSO YouTube page as well. So for Derek young, I'm Mason Voth. Thanks for watching and listening to K state online.